Hello, AP Psychers, and welcome to Galusha's Corner. Today, we are taking a look at 7.1 Theories of Motivation. Let's jump right in. As we look at motivations, it's important for us to not only define it, but also distinguish it from emotions. So motivations really are a two-step process. They're a specific need or desire. That's really step one. You have this need, you have this thing called, we call it a drive in psychology, and it directs you to go do something, some kind of very specific goal. So it's gonna energize behavior towards a specific goal. Now, motives are different. Those are emotions, sorry, emotions. Emotions are different than motives. Emotions are like fear and joy and surprise and sadness. And they underlie a behavior, but not, might not really predict behavior. Let me give an example. If I have a motive, right, I have a need. Let's say I'm driven uh, because I'm thirsty. And so that's going to be my need, my tension, my drive that's going to get me to go do a goal-directed behavior, which is to go watch a movie. No, no, right? My goal-directed behavior would be to go get a drink of water. You were surprised that I kind of changed it up because it makes it makes sense. I'm thirsty. You go get water. Emotions, though, are different. I might be sad. So I might go watch a movie. I might cry alone in, in my room. I might try to listen to my sad playlist. There's a lot of different things that might happen when I'm sad. I might bury the, the emotions down inside because I live in a society with toxic masculinity. I'm not allowed to have emotions. Like all of this stuff could happen. So motives are much more clear cut. You have a desire, you got a need, you go ahead and you fulfill that. Emotions are going to be a little more murky. We'll get to those next week. Now, one other kind of caveat here before we start our full uh, look at emotions. Remember, as we're looking at motives, remember that uh, we don't have instincts, instincts as, as humans. So we're not going to talk about instincts for humans. Instincts are for animals, not for humans. Uh, instincts are very complex behaviors that have a fixed pattern throughout an entire species. So here we see this complex behavior of building this type of house for this type of bird that is the same across the entire species. Not all humans build this exact type of house. Uh, we do not all uh, so you, here you see a peacock has a very specific way of mating procedures. Thankfully, we do not all follow the bachelor as our mating procedures. Uh, we do not have fixed patterns of behavior that are complex across our entire species. So we won't be talking about instincts. We'll be talking more about motives. And again, motives are defined as a need or desire. Step one, we call that a drive that then directs goal behavior. So let's take first a look first at those things that cause drives, that cause a need. One of those could be biological. Okay, so that's going to be uh, unlearned. A baby's going to feel this. So anytime you have something that's unlearned, this little guy right here, it's creepy, right? Uh, he's been with me for quite a while in AP Psychology. Uh, this little guy right here, as a baby, doesn't have to be taught that it's hungry. It just comes out feeling that way when it's hungry. So biological drives, ask yourself, would, would this guy feel it? Okay, that's a biological drive. So these are hunger, thirst, and yes, sex is a biological drive when you get older. Okay, that's part of evolutionary psychology. And all of this is controlled by a brain structure right here in the limbic system called your hypothalamus. It controls three things, hunger, thirst, and your sexual drive. Those are primary drives. Um, evolutionary psychology talks about our, our four Fs, fighting, fleeing, feeding, and reproducing as biological drives. Now, biological drives are really governed by homeostasis. So if you are thirsty, you're going to go out and you're going to get a drink, but you're not going to keep drinking forever, right? That would be ridiculous. If you're hungry, you're going to go get food, but you're not going to keep eating forever. Eventually, you'll feel full, right? You'll hit homeostasis. You'll hit balance. So our desire to fulfill um, primary drives is going to stop at a point of balance or homeostasis. Homeostasis is that psychological, that physiological equilibrium attained when a tension or drive has been reduced or eliminated. That's just a physiological, not psychological there. Um, so we are going to fulfill our primary drives until we reach homeostasis. We'll eat until they are full, but not so full that they extend that. Now, there are other circumstances that change that, but in, in, in essence, primary drives are fulfilled until they hit homeostasis. 
Secondary drives, though, are different. These are drives that you have to be taught. You have to be taught that you want wealth or success or fame. This is a learned behavior. And the other thing I want you to realize with secondary drives is we don't do those until homeostasis, right? I don't think the Kardashians have ever said, oh, I'm too famous now. Like they just want more and more like Scrooge McDuck here just wants more and more and more money. We're never like, oh, no, my bank account is too full. I'm all set. No, no, thanks. I couldn't have another hundred dollars, please. We will keep fulfilling secondary drives way past homeostasis. So secondary drives are things that we want to do that are learned behaviors. And we do not bring in a discussion of homeostasis into those secondary drives. So primary versus secondary. Primary is biological. It pushes us to do a biologically driven act, hunger, thirst, or sex. Secondary drives pull at our actions. And definitely when both are combined, uh, we have a very, very powerful force. And so a lot of things uh, that are more complex in life are going to be kind of involving uh, a desire to fulfill a primary drive and also a secondary drive. How do we learn those secondary drives, by the way? Well, one of the ways that we do that is through operant conditioning. So your behavior is motivated to get rewards or to avoid punishment. So you might have a secondary drive that wants you to be uh, eventually secure and, and wealthy and successful. So you go to work at Dunkin' Donuts to get money to pay for college, so you can go to college to get a career, but you're doing all of that to kind of increase secondary drives. Um, operant conditioning might also uh, have you come home at curfew so you don't have problems with your parents, you're avoiding a punishment there, and you're doing that so you can fulfill a secondary drive of uh, having a, a safe place that is calm and nice for you to, to live in. So those are secondary drives, and it might be best described by operant conditioning factors that you've learned that you should have these drives because it makes your life better. Now let's talk about those goals. We've talked about the things that push you, primary and secondary drives. What is pulling you towards, what are the incentives that are pulling you towards this stuff? Now there might be incentives that you see in your environment. The key word here is environmental cue. An incentive is an environmental cue that triggers a motive. So maybe you didn't have the desire before, but now in the environment, I see her drinking this nice cold uh, bottle of water it's a hot day. I didn't realize I was thirsty until I saw that incentive in the environment. And now I want water. Same thing if you've ever smelled something yummy at a bakery and you weren't hungry before. And now because you've seen it, now you have the drive. So the incentive can come out of the environment. It has to be from the environment. Have I said environment enough? I'll say it one more time. Environment. The incentive comes from the environment. And now all of a sudden it's sparked a drive in you. Right now, if someone walked past my room as I'm recording this with a thing of chocolate chip cookies, I would totally want chocolate chip cookies because I smelled that. And I would leave the video immediately to go fulfill that newfound drive of mine, kind of primary uh, drive because I'm hungry. Now, there are also two types of rewards that we might want to get out of our motives. Um, so those rewards would be intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. These are the rewards. So an intrinsic motivator is the action itself is rewarding. So doing it is rewarding, playing something, listening to music, anything that you just enjoy because the act itself is fun. The stuff that you do during your free time, that's intrinsic motivation stuff that makes you on the inside feel accomplished and proud. Do you notice how the word in is in there? So it's all going to happen. All the reward is going to happen from the event or how you feel on the inside. And extrinsic motivators, you're doing it for some other reason. You are doing it for some other reason. You are um, uh, doing it for money. That is the easiest example. You're doing it for just the grade. That's another easy example. Uh, but you are you don't care why you're filling out or doing this work. You don't enjoy the work. You're just doing it so you can hand it in and get a paycheck or a grade. Um, it, you are doing it for a reward that is outside. It's nothing is coming. No joy is coming in from you here. You just want that, that reward from the outside, that extrinsic motivator. So intrinsic motivators refers to motivation that comes from inside an individual. 
and not external or outside rewards. So not money or grades. This is in, this is internal. It's stronger. Okay, it's stronger than external motivators. Extrinsic motivator is a carrot on a stick. Okay, it is you care about GPA and not other things. This is stuff that comes from our outside rewards. Money or grades are your best one. Intrinsic motivators, fun activities, listening to music, just enjoying becoming a better human, feeling a sense of pride. Those are intrinsic motivators. Okay, so we've got money, points, gold stars, uh, punishment, your title, levels, leaderboards. That's extrinsic. Intrinsic is mastery, love, fun, the just learning, self-knowledge, belonging, passion. Those are intrinsic motivators. Now let's get into the three theories of motivation. The first one is really simple. This is going to be almost should be called the primary drive reduction theory. It's the drive reduction theory. The definition is in the term right there for you. You have a physiological drive, a primary drive. You have a state of tension. So step one, physiological drive. Step two, a state of tension. And therefore, you go and reduce that need. Uh, very, very simple. It is great to explain primary drives. The goal of, of drive reduction is, like we talked about with uh, primary drives, is homeostasis. So you have an empty stomach. That's the drive. It creates a tension. You've all felt it, that, that hunger in your tummy because you almost feel like you're sick because you're so hungry. And then you go ahead and you, you have uh, you, you eat. And hopefully you stop. You stop at homeostasis. And that reduces the drive, drive reduction theory. So drive reduction theory, our strengths, it does a great draw, job explaining most primary drives. Um, it explains why if I'm hungry right now, I'm going to eat. If I'm thirsty right now, I'm going to take a drink. But it does start to fall apart with more complex primary drives, such as sex. Uh, no matter what the primary drive is for how you're feeling, you're probably not going to start uh, engaging in sexual activity right next to someone in class, right? Like that, there are other social things that we pile up on top of that that keep us from doing that primary drive immediately, right? So pr drive reduction theory doesn't explain why we do that. Hey, it doesn't even explain why you might eat past homeostasis at a really yummy buffet. So it really starts to fall apart in primary drives that are more complex. Um, it also falls apart with secondary drives. Um, you might feel the need for money and then you might go try to get money, but it doesn't explain that you're gonna stop. Like if all of a sudden the, the water fountain here at the school started spewing $20 bills, you, you would just stay there the entire day and get $20 bills. You'd never be like, oh no, I'm too full. I don't want that. So the strength does a nice job explaining most primary drives, hunger and thirst-ish, but it really kind of falls apart with complex primary drives like sex and definitely falls apart when we do it to secondary drives like getting money because we don't stop at homeostasis. Second of three theories is arousal theory. Arousal theory means... Now, let's understand arousal in psychology. I know I just talked about sex. Arousal means a level of alertness and attentiveness, not that kind of sexual arousal. There's a connection there as to why we say that. But in our society, we hear arousal and we think sex. What I want you to hear in psychology is a level of alertness and attentiveness. I just want you to think about your level of arousal when you're out with your friends versus attending a first period Google Meet. Different levels of arousal. And all arousal theory says is we, not weak, we seek the best level of alertness for any given time. So we look for the best level of alertness. Sometimes we want low arousal. Sometimes we want tons of arousal. Okay, some of us tend to want more arousal than, than, than others. Some of us want less arousal. So arousal theory says we seek the best level of arousal. People do things in order to get what they consider to be their best level or optimal level of arousal. So if you want a high level of arousal, that might explain why sometimes you're like, hey guys, let's go do something epic tonight. I need to have an adventure. And there are other weeks where you've had a horrible week and you're like, I need a low level of arousal. Let's stay in tonight and watch Netflix. You might be bored with your life. You want a, low, you want a higher level of arousal. So you go get a new job. You might be overly stressed at work. So you want a low level of arousal and you go get a vacation. 
all arousal theory says is that you're probably seeking that activity. You're probably motivated to do that activity because you want the right level of alertness and, and, a, and awakeness and attentiveness at any given moment. Now, underneath arousal theory is this thing called the yerkes dotson Law. It's proven, and it is proven about performance. You have to highlight that. Our yerkes dotson Law is all about someone's performance. Now, if I want to make your performance good, I can use the yerkes dotson Law. And what the yerkes dotson Law says, if I have a difficult task, let's pretend we're taking an AP Lang uh, exam in May. It's a difficult task for any of us, right? We are best with a moderate level of arousal. So here's our complex task, AP Lang, and our, here's our performance bump here. And the kids that do really high, you know, a five versus a one, seemed to be at a, a moderate arousal. Not a low, that would be sleeping. Not a high arousal, that would be like, ah, I'm scared. They would want a moderate level of arousal. Now, let's say you have a simple task, right? Let's say your simple task is just doing the dishes, okay? To, to do the best job possible, you don't want to be sleeping because then you'd like bang dishes together and break them and miss things. And you don't want a super high level of arousal ever for anything on performance. A nice moderately high arousal, higher arousal here is going to keep you up. If you, anybody here has a faster playlist for cleaning your room, you're using the Dirk Stotson Law. You're doing an easy task and you are increasing your, you're seeking out a higher level of arousal so you can improve your performance. When you guys see a question on the exam and it deals with performance and it's talking about levels of arousal, it's asking you to answer your Stotson Law. Strengths of, of the arousal theories, it does a very nice job explaining most secondary drives, really does explain why we seek out these things because we want to be more interested or less interested, more aroused or less aroused. The weakness, though, is it doesn't show how we prioritize our motives, which will lead us right into our next one, which is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You can't get out of an AP Psych class without hearing about it. Abraham Maslow created categories of needs he suggested that certain needs have priorities over others. Here is his list of needs. So it starts off at the base. He says you need physiological needs, those primary drives. You need to be you know, not hungry and thirsty. You need to have oxygen. These are your basics. Once you have these, the next thing you'll prioritize is safety. This is you need to feel safe and secure, have a roof over your head, not be physically abused at your house. You need to feel those safety needs. Once you have safety needs, then you're gonna be concerned about getting belongingness and love from others. That could be your parental units, that could be your friends. And now think about this, this priority makes sense. You know, if you all of a sudden walk into a cafeteria and there's no oxygen in the room, I doubt you're like, oh, I wonder who I'm going to sit with today. You're going to revert back to the bottom of that pyramid and go try to satiate your physiological need of breathing before you worry about having friends to sit with. But for most of us, luckily, we have our physiological needs met and our safety needs met. And so we are a lot of us working on finding groups of people to be with. That's our belongingness and our love needs. Once we feel like we have a base of people, hopefully at home, okay, hopefully your best friends and they are accepting of who you are and they love you, you work on your esteem needs. You do things to show that you're a pretty cool person. You do achievement needs and you look for independence and need for recognition. A lot of you are involved in sports or theater because it does a great job giving you that recognition. Some of you, if be honest, if you ever tell someone you're in AP psych and not just psych, that's a little bit of an esteem need. Okay. Anytime you make a little weird brag and you kind of know you're doing it, that you're, whatever you're choosing to do the weird brag about is your esteem need. You're kind of saying it because you're pretty cool and you're proud of that. And you should take ownership of that. We all need it. And once we've met our esteem needs, um, Maslow's going to say that we're going to move up to self-actualization, which we're, you're living up to your fullest and your unique, unique potential. 
is you'll see that very full there very few of us actually get all the way here and not only are you working up to your fullest and your your own your own unique potential you're actualizing who you should become but you're also willing to face that down um, uh, against others who say you shouldn't be like that so let's say you're someone like a martin luther king jr or a gandhi who is fighting for uh, equality amongst different groups of people that even when you are put in jail or you have to do a hunger strike or have a uh, fire hose turned against you that you're still willing to fight for what you understand to be who you are and what you believe in the world and so that self-actualization is you're also willing to stand up for uh, that because you have all of these other needs met sometimes when you're doing your self-actualization you will forego earlier needs because you are so sure in what you're fighting for of the hierarchy has allowed you to get there. Strengths, it shows how we prioritize our, move, our motives. It explains why some people can forego basic needs, like I just said. The weakness, though, is while it's very explanatory, it's not necessarily based on a whole lot of experience, uh, empirical research by Maslow. Maslow is from the humanism school of psychology, which is a little wishy-washy on its research methods. Um, so it's there, um, but it's the sample size of what Maslow did, um, and it's so broad that uh, the research there is a little bit muddled. But definitely something I think you'll end up kind of enjoying. Okay, that is a quick look at 7.1, and tomorrow we will pick it up with 7.2 specific topics and motivation. Take care, AP Psychers.